We come back to have a look at the ecclesial growth that uh, resulted from the work of Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, uh, king of Judah. This is the this is the area that we're going to be considering uh, in this particular study. We're going to have a look at Jehoshaphat, who's down here, the king of Judah, and of course his uh, contemporary kings in the north. Uh, uh, the family of Omri, and particularly, of course, Ahab, and is going to cause a lot of problems for Jehoshaphat as time goes on. And so we come to, to look at the early life of this man, his objectives, uh, what he sets about to do uh, to encourage development and growth in Judah. Now, we, we put this, this uh, chart of, uh, of the details of Jehoshaphat up before you, and we call him the enigmatic educator. And the reason for that is pretty obvious, isn't it? He was, above all things, he was an educator of his people. But he was also an enigma. An enigma because he made an alliance with the house of Ahab and then with Ahab's sons, two of them. Three alliances, basically, which all were disastrous. And he didn't learn, he didn't learn from those experiences uh, right to the end of his life. So he, he's an enigma in many ways. Now, to be quite frank, that's pretty normal, isn't it, for human nature? <laughs> we, can, we can stand for good things, we can do a lot of good things, and then all of a sudden you think, well, where does that come from? So it happens to all of us from time to time. We can learn some very important lessons from this man. His name means Yahweh is judge from the root word meaning to judge or to vindicate. And that's what he does. He vindicates the righteousness of God. So, by a paraphrase, the name can mean Yahweh is vindicated. And he was vindicated in this man, Jehoshaphat. He came to the throne at age 35, which means he was probably somewhere around 10 years of age when he saw the reformation of his father, Asa, which was so successful... And that's what impressed him as a young boy. You know, it's important, isn't it, the things that, that we get our children to be impressed with. So you take them to Bible schools and all that sort of thing, and, and they're impressed with the fact that the truth is a wonderful, positive thing. Because they're going to get enough negatives, aren't they? In normal life, they're going to get enough negatives. But if you can get that into them, they realise that there's something really important about this. That's what happened to Jehoshaphat. And he set his course from an early age. He reigned for 25 years. His mother's name was Azubar, which means desertion, daughter of Shilhai, meaning armed. Not that that, of course, tells us very much, but we do know this, that mothers play a very important part in the lives of kings, as they do in the lives of every one of us. Do you know that there's one king of Judah whose mother's name's not mentioned? I'll give you one guess. You know who it is? One king of Judah whose mother's name's not mentioned. Nobody? Ahaz. This is that King Ahaz. No mention of none. So we, had, we, we, see, we see that these names are here for a reason. She probably had a, a very important part to play in the development of Jehoshaphat as a boy and as a teenager. Now we had a look at this chart. We saw that Judah reached these great heights here in the times of Asa, well, they were to be followed by a similar period of Reformation. And we're going to have a look at that record. I want you to come to 2 Chronicles chapter 17. It's the record of the accession of King Jehoshaphat. So in the record of 2 Chronicles 17, we read in verse 1. And Jehoshaphat his son, Asa's son, reigned in his stead... I want you to notice the very first thing that it says about him. And he strengthened himself against Israel. You have to ask, why? Why does he do this? Strengthens himself against Israel. Well, because of what was happening in the north. What was happening in the north is that Omri had established a very strong dynasty. His son Ahab came to power in his stead. He married Jezebel. He brought idolatry, Baal worship into Israel and corrupted the nation even more than Jeroboam had corrupted it. 
This is what was going on in the north. So what are you going to do about that? Make sure that you strengthen yourself against those influences. You don't want them coming in to your ecclesia. You've got to strengthen yourself. Not necessarily going to fight a war, but you're going to strengthen yourself against it. And that's what he does. Very first thing recorded. This was Ahab's third year when Jehoshaphat comes to the throne. Okay? Ahab had been around for three years by this time. It says he placed forces in all the fenced cities of Judah, verse 2, and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa his father had taken in his uh, conflict with Baasha. And Yahweh was with Jehoshaphat. This is a fulfilment of 2 Chronicles 15, verse 2. If ye be with him, he will be with you. Okay, it's a proof of that. Yahweh was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David, it says. Now that can be unravelled a little bit because in actual fact it should read this way because he worked he walked in the first ways of his father meaning Asa and of David so he looked to the early example of his father and beyond that to the example of David they were his models upon which he would model his own approach uh, to the education and reformation of his people and it says at the end of verse 3 and he sought not unto Balaam well who said that he would so you, when you read the scripture you, you've got to read it carefully you've got to ask yourself well, why is that there oh, what's that mean well it means that in the north they were seeking after Balaam This is why in verse 1 he strengthened himself against Israel because that's what they were doing. Ahab was going out finding a wife, Jezebel, who was a Baal worshipper, bringing all that into Israel, see? So it's telling us that he had a deliberate policy of separation from what was happening in the north. He was not going to allow that to corrupt his people, his ecclesia. It says in verse 4, but he sought to the God of his father, that is, Asa, and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. So in my Bible, there are certain things highlighted. Against Israel, verse 1. End of verse 3, sought not unto Balaam. And at the end of verse 4, and not after the doings of Israel. They're all telling us the same thing, are they not? That there was this deliberate policy of being different to the way that they were in the north under the leadership of Ahab. And we're going to come to Ahab, of course, uh, pretty soon. So what does Jehoshaphat set out to do in this campaign, a deliberate opposition to Jezebel's campaign of education in the north? Was Jezebel an an educator? Well, of course she was. Christ tells us that in Revelation 2 verse 20. She was an adulteress who taught my servants to commit idolatry and fornication. Yeah. So she was an educator, as was Ahab, as was Omri his father. And we're going to see how important a part Omri plays in the scheme of things a little later on. So education was going on in the northern kingdom in Baal worship and all sorts of corruptions. Jehoshaphat's campaign in the south is deliberately designed to oppose that. So what does he do? Well, he sends out educators. So have a look at what what the record tells us here. It says in verse 5, Therefore Yahweh established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presents, and he had riches and honour and abundance, and his heart was lifted up, not in pride. Notice what it says in verse 6. His heart was lifted up in the ways of Yahweh, which is where it should be. Moreover, he took away the high places and the groves out of Judah. So he eradicates what there might have remained of the apostasy of his grandfather uh, that Asa had not cleaned up or that might have been restored when Asa's faith failed. We don't know exactly when that, but he took away whatever he found that was, that was corrupting in Judah. But then he starts this deliberate campaign. In the third year of his reign, verse 7, he sent to his, he sent to his princes, even to Ben-Hale, and to Obadiah, and to Zechariah, and to Nethaneel, and to Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. Now the the names of those men are very interesting. We don't have time to to stop and consider them. So there are five princes. Five's the number of? Grace. 
Okay? Nine Levites, nine is the number of finality and judgment. Okay? And two priests. And they go forth. They're sent to teach the entire nation the law of Yahweh. And we read about this verse 8. And with them he sent Levites. And their names are listed. And at the end of that verse, verse 8, and with them Elishama, whose name means Ale of Hearing, Elishama and Jehoram, priests. Jehoram means Yahweh raised. So here go these priests, and what do they do, verse 9? They taught in Judah. And that word taught is Lamad. Lamad means the goad. What do they use the goad for? Sharp pointed stick? Poke it into cattle on other animals to goad them along, see, to push them along. Now I want you to keep that in mind because that's what Jezebel was doing to Ahab in the north. You're going to see that. She was goading him to evil. Down in the south, Jehoshaphat sending out these men, five princes, nine Levites and two priests in order to educate his people in the ways of his God. These two priests were obviously appointed because they had the the skill and ability to do that job. So where was Jehoiada? We made mention of Jehoiada, didn't we, in our previous study. Where was he? Well, he probably remained in the temple in Jerusalem because he, he became high priest within the next 25 years. He was climbing up, you might say, the, the echelon of priesthood, slowly but surely. He was a teaching priest. That's proven by what he does with Joash. All right? Amariah was the chief priest at the time, but Amariah was doubtless preparing Jehoiada to take over his role, which, of course, he fulfilled with, with uh, distinction uh, in the coming decades. So what were the outcomes of Jehoshaphat's deliberate campaign of education? Well, huh, wonderful outcomes. Verse 10. And the fear of Yahweh fell upon all the kingdoms of the lands that were round about Judah. You know, there's a proverb that says, Proverbs 16 verse 7 says, When a man's ways please Yahweh, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's true. Asa proved that, didn't he? God gave Asa peace. Why? Well, because his ways pleased Yahweh. So this was proven again in the life of his son. Uh, here, because of this campaign of education and growth and development. And it says at the end of verse 10, so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. It says in verse 12, after telling us about the Philistines and the Arabians who bring their gifts in verse 11, it says in verse 12, and Jehoshaphat waxed great exceedingly. Now these are very interesting words. There's three Hebrew words here rendered, waxed, great, exceedingly. It's halak, which means to walk, gadel, great, mayar, to go upward. So that literally it should be rendered, Jehoshaphat walked exceedingly upward. So this is his, this is his course, right? He is growing. He and the nation are growing He waxes or walks exceedingly upward. And that word is used earlier in his life. And you see, if you just cast your eye back to verse 6, his heart was lifted up. The Hebrew word lifted up there is gabar. It means to soar. To soar like an eagle. Alright, so here is a man who is going upwards. Now, you might think, well, why are you emphasising this so much? The next chapter tells you. Because the next chapter says he goes down to Samaria. So the man who in chapter 17 is going upwards and soaring in the things of God ends up going down and ends ends up with a nation that doesn't have a king. Not even him. I see all Israel, says my Haiah, as sheep having no shepherd. Where's Joshua gone. Oh, he's still there. He's gone because he's not the leader he once was. So this is the sad thing about the life of Jehoshaphat. Something very important to be learned out of his life. But this is a record, chapter 17, of the multiplying blessings from God because he is soaring. 
in the things of his God. So where does it lead? Well, the record beyond that, verse 13 says, he had much business. Doesn't talk, that's not, doesn't mean commercial business. It actually means, the word means deputyship. He had much deputyship. In other words, he had men promoting the nation's interests, economic interests, spiritual interests, and much business uh, in Jerusalem. And then the army of Jehoshaphat is spelled out for us. Anyone know uh, what, the so- <coughs> what the size of uh, his father's army was? Anyone? Yeah, which is half, half of Jehoshaphat's army. So he doubles. He doubles the size of Judah's army. Now, you recall the army of Abijah. How many men did Abijah have when he came out to take the kingdom back from Jeroboam? 400,000. It's now up to 1,160,000. Development. It's unbelievable growth, isn't it? It's just... It's exponential growth. Why? Because Yahweh's blessing him. That's why. The ecclesia is growing in mighty men of valour. Because Yahweh's blessing him because of the campaign of education. But the wheels are going to fall off. That's the sad part about it. They're going to fall off. So here he has his army. Rehoboam has has 180,000 men. Abijah had 400,000 men who could fight the war. Asa had 580,000 men. Ahab in the north, when faced with the Syrians at Aphek, had an army that was described like two little flocks of kids. Right? Piddling little army because of what was happening in the north. They were being drained of their strength because of Jezebel's campaigns of education, the destruction of Yahweh's prophets. So what message do we get out of that? It's obvious, isn't it? You don't have to state it. It's telling us something. You want the ecclesia to grow? You want the brotherhood to grow? You educate people in the things of the word of God. You promote the things of the truth. You get people's minds where they should be. And you grow and develop. And God blesses it. That's what happens here in the time of Jehoshaphat. And I've had that experience in life, and doubtless you have too, brothers and sisters, brothers. Because I went to an ecclesia that had 20 members and they were dwindling away. And joined with a few brethren, and we got our heads down and we said, what are we going to do about this? And we started some study classes and we got into Elpis Israel and we, got, we did the things we knew worked. Guess what? Ecclesia became 115 members, spawned to other ecclesias. One of those now I belong to, it's got 85 members, and it's continuing. We've got a Sunday school of 70. How does that come about? Our work? No. It's the blessing of God on those who promote his word amongst his people. That's what it is. And so there's a very, very simple but important lesson in what we're seeing here in 2 Chronicles chapter 17. This is about ecclesial growth. And we read this in the last, second last verse of the chapter, verse 18. And next him, next to him was Jehoshaphat, and with him a hundred and fourscore thousand, ready, prepared for the war. What war? What war? Well, inevitably there was going to be conflict with the north, and their Baal-worshipping leader, inevitably. But it didn't happen that. The war was never fought. Verses 1 and 2 suggest the answer of the next chapter, 2 Chronicles 18. Suggest the answer. Jehoshaphat had remembered the attack, sorry, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 17. Jehoshaphat remembered the attack by Baasha, king of Israel, that brought disaster to Asa. He remembered that. He had prepared Judah against the policies of Israel in the north, but they never got to fight the conflict. They never got to fight the war because he made, but chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, he made a marriage alliance with the house of Ahab. So strong defences against military attack, especially against the infiltration of Baal worship, was essential. We saw that in verses 3 and 4. 
But what was happening in Israel at the same time was that there is another dedicated, determined, concerted campaign of education in corruption. And that's why he was preparing for a war. But it was never fought. I want to turn then to what happens in chapter 18 and what happened prior to chapter 18 in the development of events in Israel in the north. And there's a formula here that I think you probably all know. You might not necessarily know how important it is in the scheme of things. So I want you to take careful note of this passage, Micah 6 and verse 16. Now I don't need to take you to the context because the context is not going to add a lot to it. This is a statement made by God through Micah the prophet and we're going to see the connection with another Micah or Micaiah. Two different men, two different eras, but we're going to see that there's a connection between them in our studies. But this statement is made. For the statutes of Omri are kept and all the works of the house of Ahab. So we've just been talking about the works of the house of Jehoshaphat. We have seen the blessing that was going on in Judah because of his campaign of education. We have seen them preparing for the war. And the war was clearly going to be with the Baal worshippers of the north who would attack them at some point. Well, it didn't happen. Now this word here, statutes, used in Micah 6 verse 16, means in the Hebrew an ordinance, an enactment or something prescribed. Its first occurrence is way back in in Genesis 26 and verse 5. And there's a principle involved in all of this. The principle is filled out by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. You see, when statutes are laid down, either for good or evil, they have a purpose. And Paul talks about the purpose of the law. In 1 Timothy 1 he says... The law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient. Now, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Now, that's a very important passage because it shows the nexus between doctrine and practice. And so it's a simple fact that if your doctrines are corrupt, your behaviour is ultimately going to be corrupt. We are what we think. Right? If, you, if your doctrines are corrupt, behaviour is going to follow that pattern. That's a divine principle. So here in Judah, we've got Jehoshaphat teaching good things and God's blessing it and the behaviour is complementary to that. In the north, you've got Ahab teaching corrupt things with his wife. Guess what? The behaviour is very corrupt. So doctrine and practice are joined together. That's the the point that's being made here. So when God says about the statutes of Omri, he's telling us how important Omri was in the scheme of things. Omri was the educator like Jehoshaphat was an educator. Ahab was the implementer. That's why he talks about the works of the house of Ahab. So the statutes, the teachings, the doctrines of Omri are kept and all the works, you see, doctrine produces behaviour. Ahab's the implementer. That's a very, as you'll see, very important statement made in the scriptures. I want to turn then to the Omrid dynasty in the north. See what was happening in the north. The statutes of Omri ended up, unfortunately, coming into Judah. And we read that they came into Judah. Let's just have a look at 2 Chronicles 22. So just go along a few pages in 2 Chronicles to, to chapter 22. Now this is about Ahaziah, who it says in verse 2 was 40 and 2 years old. Now that is not correct. There may be a copyist error there. We don't know how this turns out, but in actual fact it should read 20 and 2 years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. So that's 2 Chronicles 22 verse 2. It should read 22 years old when he began to reign. 
He reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri. So whose daughter was she? She's the daughter of Ahab. And probably, most probably, the daughter of Jezebel. Because she's very much like her mother okay, in her behaviour. So what does it say Omri? Omri is her grandfather. And you see, this is the kind of thing that when you read the scripture, you need to say, well, hang on, hang on a minute. We're told elsewhere that she's the daughter of Ahab. But here we're told she's the daughter of Omri. Now, why? Well, let's explore it. You see, your context is going to give you the answers most of the time. But let's just read on. It says of Ahaziah, verse 3, He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab. For his mother was his counsellor to do wickedly. There's your answer. What was Omri? He was the statute maker. He was the one who taught, who laid down statutes and ordinances. Okay? He was the one who influenced the, the behaviour of Ahab. This was happening in the house of Judah. Ahaziah, the king, was influenced by Athaliah, his mother, who's described as the daughter of Omri, because Omri was the counsellor in her family, the one who laid down the statutes, and she was laying down statutes for her son. We read that in verse 4. Wherefore he did evil in the sight of Yahweh, like the house of Ahab. So the works of the house of Ahab were being done in Judah, for they were his counsellors after the death of his father to his destruction. See the idea of that? They were his counsellors. So that's why that statement of Micah 6 verse 16 is so important. So what about the rise of this statute maker, Omri? He doesn't get as much attention, does he, as what he might deserve, given what we've just said about God's statement concerning his influence. We need to have a look at him. There was, there was a time of great turmoil in the northern kingdom of Israel. Assassinations of kings were endemic. You know, so you've got to be very careful at this time because you could be bumped off very quickly. Baasha slew Nadab, Jeroboam's son, 1 Kings 15.27. Zimri slew Elah, Baasha's son, 1 Kings 16.8-10. He lasted a week. He reigned one week committed suicide by burning the palace over his head and Omri was made king after a civil war. Omri defeated a challenger to the throne named Tibni. Tibni means the man of straw. All right, so he's quickly overthrown, son of Ginath, the garden. So here's the straw of the garden. That's how effective he was. Omri means heaping. Heaping of a sheep or of corn that has been cut down. And he shows that callousness, brutal callousness, that was to prevail in Israel for the rest of its history. Ripping up women with child and all that sort of stuff. Things that the Assyrians used to do. That comes into the history of Israel. But you come to 1 Kings 16. I want to have a look at the power of this man, Omri. First Kings 16 verse 23, we read about him. It tells us about the, the long ambition that he had had to rule. It says, in the thirty and first year of Asa king of Judah, began Omri to reign over Israel twelve years. Six years reigned he in Terzah, which means delightsomeness. And it says in verse 24, he bought the hill Samaria of Shema, for two talents of silver and he built on the hill and called the name of the city which he built after the name of Shema owner or lord of the hill Samaria so he names this city he purchased a prominent hill I'll show you a photo of that in a minute and constructed there a monument to his power and influence and in verse 25 we're told about him but Amri wrought evil in the eyes of Yahweh and he did worse than all that were before him including 
Jeroboam. He surpassed all previous kings in wickedness and brutality. And he promoted Jeroboam's idolatry in verse 26. He walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin, to provoke Yahweh God of Israel to anger with their vanities. And the word there does mean emptiness. In verse 27. He was noted for his might. It says, now the rest of the acts of Omri, which he did, and his might that he showed, are they not written in the book of the kings, uh, of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So this word might, Geburah, related to Gibor, has the idea of might or mastery. And that, of course, is a reference to his power in warfare. He had won the civil war, and he consolidated his power with brutality. Very, very powerful man is Omri. So the Omri dynasty is to play a huge role in the life of the southern kings of Judah from now on. He rules six years here in Terzah. He builds Samaria after buying the hill and he rules there for another six years. You notice these little uh, places that Jezreel was the summer palace of the Omris. That's because, of course, you're in the you're up on the southern side of the valley of Jezreel and you get the breezes that come down from the Mediterranean and you, know, you don't need air conditioning. So you just open the windows and you get these wonderful cool breezes in summer. But in wintertime you go down and enjoy the, the, uh, the heights of Samaria. Now we were there about 12 months ago or so. It's an interesting place, very interesting place. It's there of course, 21 miles uh, in, uh, in terms of Americans, 35 kilometres for Canadians and others from the Mediterranean and about 8 miles from Shechem. And this is the hill, the hill of Samaria from the north today. Uh, and you look southwest towards the Mediterranean coast uh, and it's called this place because of the palace that was built up there initially by Amorai, but then refurbished by, by Ahab, it was called by Yahweh the crown of pride. Shall we look at Isaiah 28 and just see how God looked at this place that was built by Omri and Ahab? So Isaiah 28, verses 1 to 4, describe this place. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Now we're going to make something of this in due time, because when God destroys the dynasty of Omri through Jehu, there's an expectation amongst those who wanted to stand for the truth, men like Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, okay, there was an expectation that there would be a huge reformation and there would be a return to the truth in Israel in the north. That's why Jehonadab joins Jehu with the destruction of the house of Ahab and Baal worshippers. It doesn't happen. You know why it doesn't happen? Because when Jehu comes to the palace of Ahab, he finds the biggest wine cellar that the world had known to the time. He finds an ivory-tipped palace with the wealth of the day and he is overwhelmed by it. The reformation of Jehu fails because of wealth and wine. And so when God describes this place as the crown of pride, he's, you, know, you saw that hill, you saw the hill, well, the wall went around the top like a crown on a man's head and inside that was all the jewels of the palace the, the ivory-tipped palace of Ahab, like a crown of pride. But inside that place were the drunkards of Ephraim, whose lives were given over to the, to, the, to the apostate wine, so to speak, that Jezebel taught through her prophets. Go and read on, verse 2. Behold, and you should read Yahweh, Behold, Yahweh hath a mighty and a strong one, which is a tempest of hail and destroying storms, a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet. And the glorious beauty, which is on the head of the fat valley, shall be a fading flower. And as the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he that looketh upon it seeth, while well, there's yet in his hand, he eats it up. 
to this place, the city of pride and plenty, built on the confluence of three lines of hills in a wide valley that runs from Shechem to the coast, sat at the head of what's called the fat valleys. They were so prosperous, bringing forth all sorts of fruits, the vine that created the wine and the, and the olive trees, etc., which you can see there today when you go there. But this, of course, raised the issue of power, didn't it? Why this prosperity? Why did this happen? Was it because God was blessing it? Or because of the brute force of Omri and of Ahab and of Jezebel, his wife? Was it Yahweh or Baal that was doing this? This was the great question of the time. Well, it was to be proven, unfortunately, because of Jehoshaphat's compromise that Baal would prevail for a time. That's the sad part about it. In the record of 1 Kings 22 and verse 39, we read about that palace of ivory. So let's just come back to 1 Kings 22. It says this in 1 Kings 22, 39, Now the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did, and the ivory house which he, had, which he made, and all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? That's what is meant by the phrase in Micah 6 and verse 16, all the works of the house of Ahab. They were physical works, they were spiritual works, they were works that had an influence upon the prosperity of that time. It was not the blessing of God. It was this life of opulence and luxury and splendour, the, the ivory that was used to cover certain parts of the palace and, and his throne and so on, all of that was about self-indulgence. It was not about a blessing from God. And you say, we read this in Amos 3.15, I will smite the winter house with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, saith Yahweh. So he was going to bring judgment upon all of this, this self-indulgent prosperity. Winter and summer. The wealthy had two houses. Samaria housed Ahab's ivory palace, but Jezebel, Jezreel was his summer home, as we saw. And of course, this was, the, this was the antithesis of what Elijah and later on John the Baptist stood for. You know, we read in our readings, didn't we, recently? You know, where are you going to find? Where are you going to find people that wear glorious garments and, and eat sumptuously, fare sumptuously every day? in king's palaces. You don't find them out in the wilderness where Elijah came from or where John the Baptist came. You don't find those sort of people there. This is the principle involved here. Luke 7.25 But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. This was what was in the house of Omri. And Ahab proves himself to be Israel's worst king. Omri's greatest legacy was the tutelage of his son. He was the statute maker, the one who laid down the platform for his son and Ahab took it up. Now Ahab signifies, his name means the brother or friend of his father. Alright? He's a resemblance of his father. That's what his name means and so he is. So come back to 1 Kings 16. Let's just very quickly deal with this. It's a it's a, a full record that could, that could, we could spend a lot of time on it. But we'll just very briefly summarise what we have here in the end of chapter 16 of the first of Kings. Verse 30 tells us, And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of Yahweh above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, and her name, by the way, means chaste, not C-H-A-S-E-D. But she was chaste by, she had 400 boyfriends. No, so she was chaste quite often. It's C-H-A-S-T-E, chaste. Well, what a misnomer that is. I mean, she's the most corrupt woman in history, apart from Semiramis, all right, which was her model. So she modelled herself on Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod. She was not chaste. She had 400 boyfriends at least. So he got this incredible misnomer. It says concerning her, he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal. Ethbaal means with or near Baal. She never left Baal. 
king of the Zidonians, the fishermen, the ones who fish for people to capture men. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. So the historical origins of Jezebel and the worship that she brought into Israel go back to Cush and Nimrod. Now this is why Micah 6 verse 16 is so important. The statutes of Omri are kept and all the works of the house of Ahab. Doctrine produces works. Okay? Cush was the great original prophet of the Babylonian mysteries. He was the statute maker. He was the one that came up with the Catholic catechism. Alright? Well, the doctrines of the Catholic system came from the mind of Cush, the great statute maker. So we could render that verse a bit differently. We could use it another way. The statutes of Cush are kept. And all the works of the house of Nimrod. Yeah. That's what came into Israel. And it's on its way into Judah in the times of Manasseh as well, as we're going to see. It's like Catholicism coming into the brotherhood of the latter days. Would that happen? There are places where the Christadelphians share the local building that they helped to build with the Catholic Church. Yeah. So you see it is coming into the brotherhood in various ways. So this is why it's so important to see what Jehoshaphat achieved, what he set out to achieve, and to see the disaster that occurs when he changes his policy. Jezebel in the Brotherhood. We know she was in the Brotherhood. In the Thyatiran epoch of Revelation chapter 2, remember? It refers that, that particular letter to the, to the Ecclesia at Thyatira by our Lord Jesus Christ refers in history to the period from AD 606 to 1572 when true witnessing came to an end and Jezebel was ascended in the papal system. There was no purity of doctrine and where there's no purity of doctrine there's no salvation, says Paul, 1 Timothy 4. And as Christ said, I want one thing of you people at Thyatira, nothing else, just one thing. Get rid of Jezebel. That's all I want. Now, allowing error to be taught as, as that class was teaching in that ecclesia is destructive, as it was in the past. It brings, as Paul says, shipwreck to the faith. And as he pointed out that through Titus in his epistle uh, to Titus, and to the Galatians, proven teachers of error must be ejected. So the nexus that we've been talking about, the nexus between doctrine, that is the statutes and works, is undeniable. Corrupt the doctrine, and you will eventually corrupt the practice. Now I want to come to the end of 1 Kings 16. I want to read down through verse 32 onwards. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, this is Ahab's works, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, here's our Asherah again, the goddess of fertility, the goddess of sexual desire, worship with immoral rites. So he made an Asherah, and, and Ahab did more to provoke Yahweh, God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So why? Why is that statement true? Well, it's true because of verse 34. See verse 34 now? When you're reading through this, brethren, you wonder why this is here. Why is verse 34 here in, in, the, in the life of Ahab? Read the, read the verse. What has this got to do with the price of eggs? In his days did Hiel, the Bethelite, Build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abiram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Sega. According to the word of Yahweh, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. So why are we being taken back to the, to the words of Joshua in Joshua chapter 6, which, by the way, is the Armageddon chapter in Joshua, and we're told that when Jericho is destroyed, it's to be totally devoted to destruction. Now, why, why that? 
there and not next door, Ai or any other city that they took. Why, why was Jericho alone devoted to utter destruction? Anyone know? It was the home of Baal worship in Canaan. It was the centre of Nimrod worship in the land of Canaan. This was the heartland of Baal worship. So God says, absolute total destruction. I will not have a competitor. I will not allow Nimrod any life in this land. Got to be wiped out completely. So he was. For a, for a time, of course, an idiot by the name of Achan took a priestly garment, a Nimrudian priestly garment, into his possession to preserve the religion of Nimrod. Okay, so this is why it was so important. So what happens in the time of Ahab? For the first time in the history of the nation, Baal worship is back. Jericho is back. And in his days, a man begins to rebuild Jericho that is devoted to utter destruction, never to be built again. And Joshua said, Cursed be the man that rebuilds it. So how is he cursed? Look what it says there. This Hiel, he his name means living of God. He was not living of God. He was as dead as a doornail. He's rebuilding Jericho, the heartland of Baal worship. He laid the foundation thereof, and Abiram is firstborn, and he set up the gates thereof, which is the last thing you do. So you lay foundations, you build the walls, you build houses, then you put the gates up. It's the last thing you do. And in that period, we don't know how many sons he had. He might have a dozen sons. We don't know. But what we do know is this, that every single one of them died. While he's building Jericho, his sons die, stage by stage, until he's got no sons to continue his name. And what God is saying is, if you rebuild this kind of Baal worship in my land, I will cut you off like I'm going to cut the house of Ahab. That's what he's saying. A very, very powerful lesson in that. You don't mess around with Nimrudian worship. God hates it with a passion. But that's why that record is there. Because in the days of Ahab, Baal worship is restored in Israel. So this man, living of God, loses his firstborn of Byram, the father of height, the pretension of that, the pretension of what he's doing when he's laying the foundations and he loses Seeker aloft or inaccessible together with all his sons, his inheritance is gone before he completes the city. So I said Joshua 6 is the Armageddon chapter and the types of this book, Joshua and of course it has a relevance to things to come. So this is really a question of power and I want to finish this session off now it's really a question of power. Yahweh or Baal? Who gave Samaria its prosperity? Well, Baal was the sun god, said to be the giver of life. You know, we went uh, in 2010, we went to a place called Palmyra. And you might have heard of this in the news in the last couple of years because ISIS took control of Palmyra uh, last year, I think it was, or earlier this year. And they proceeded to blow up and destroy the remnants of the temples to Nabu, which is where you get Nebuchadnezzar from, okay, Nabu, one of the Babylonian gods. But most importantly, they set about to destroy the temple of Bel. And we, we, we went in and walked around this. this it, is the, it is the best preserved temple of Baal that's ever been found. It's at what used to be called Tadmor in the wilderness, which was the eastern boundary of Solomon's empire. Okay? The tent, this, is, this is the plaque, with the photograph of the plaque, which is probably not there anymore because the ISIS people blew it all, you know, they blew parts of it up. It, it, the plaque says, it is one of the greatest temples in the ancient world, it was devoted to Bel equals Baal, 
the supreme God of gods in Palmyra and Babylon. Okay? So he, he was this, this tent. So it was a question of power. So what does God do? He raises up one of the greatest prophets of the time, Elijah, the Tishbite, and sends him to the palace, the ivory palace of Baal, of, of, of Ahab, the worshipper of Baal, and says there's not going to be rain nor dew for these years, which turned out to be three and a half years, and we're going to see the importance of that three and a half years uh, a little later on. He calls this rugged prophet from the harsh region of Gilead to contend with Ahab and Jezebel. So we're going to leave it there and come back hopefully a little later on and have a look at where this all leads to the Babylonian apostasy in Israel. Have a look briefly at Ahab again, Jezebel, Elijah and Elisha. And we're going to see, as we saw a couple of years ago in our studies on Nimrod, in this place, we're going to see how important this is prophetically for us today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's Milestone Snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's Weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.